Thanks, Max. So yeah, I'm going to, is that really loud or is it just me? We're good? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some things I've been working on as well as uh, things we've been seeing across a number of our clients and then out in the community as well. And for me, a lot of it just comes down to this notion that what we're all really after, especially when we're building search-based applications, is this notion of not just doing search anymore, but how can I enhance things with discovery? And then how can I do analytics to better understand uh, what we're all after? So we're going to uh, kind of get into that at, at a, a little bit of an abstract level first. And then uh, as we progress through the talk, I'll take you into some uh, kind of the practical side, hopefully. And hopefully you'll then leave with a sense of uh, why this is useful and why probably many of you are all building similar things to this. Uh, so I'd like to kind of start off. It's been an interesting journey for me. I started out doing search uh, quite some time ago, uh, too long ago in many respects. But you, you've really seen this uh, interesting evolution to the point where I think uh, you know, if you, if you go grab Lucene or you go grab similar open source project, you can have good keyword search without really having to do too much work to that, right? It, it pretty much just works out of the box, and then the question becomes is how do you want to tune it, right? But for the most part, adding Lucene, adding Solar, Elasticsearch, whatever it is, you can get really good uh, keyword-based search out of the box, and you can do things like phrases and wildcards and all of that, right? Uh, but effectively, what you're starting to see now, and, and no thanks to uh, Google and the like, uh, you know, the bar really has been raised. Uh, when we first started Lucid four years ago, most of our questions were around, how do I get solar stood up? How do I make it scale? All of those things. Whereas I would say most questions we get now are, how do I get better results out of the system? How do I take my domain knowledge and translate that into uh, you know, more effective queries, better, uh, better products up on the first page, better sales, saving money, all of those kinds of things. And the truth is, is you know, relevance is hard, right? I mean, I think, you know, show of hands, how much time do you spend? Do you, anybody here spend more than, you know, once you have a stable system, spend more than 50% of your time tuning and tweaking to get better relevance out of your system? A good chunk of you, right? Uh, whereas, you know, the initial aspects, setting up your fields, getting all of the data in, I mean, sure, those things are uh, a pain, but really, when your business people are always asking you, how do I get better relevance out of your system? Probably is always going to be hard. Search by its nature is a subjective uh, experience, and so, therefore, you know, you can never have everything for everybody. Uh, until that one day that magic search comes along, uh, I think we're all going to be in this mode of having to tune the system, etc. Uh, and so... My view anyways, and, and kind of what this diagram is trying to get on the right, is that you really need to have a holistic view of, of your data and your users in order to have a, an effective search experience. I've done a lot of work with a lot of developers, and it usually, in, in many situations, especially if you're new to search, you spend a whole lot of time on kind of this side of this uh, Venn diagram here. You spend a lot of time getting your documents right, and you, you tweak your analysis and all of that. And then you also spend a lot of time on your queries, perhaps, although usually not so much in the early days. But once you finally realize that that's really what matters, you spend a lot of time there. And depending on the kind of content you have, if you're dealing with web pages and stuff like that, or where there's linkages between that content, or if you're doing semantic web kind of stuff, you start to realize that there's all of these nice things you can do with triples and, and the like to, to have a better and deeper understanding of how that content is. Uh, but I would say this last one here is where, uh, you know, where you get the big data problem for starts, for starters, but it's also where I think uh, you, you get a much deeper understanding of, of why you want to do all of this to begin with. And, and, and for me personally, I think the interesting thing about looking more at what users are doing with your content is it actually humanizes the problem too, right? Which, you know, we're all people, it's, it's good to have the, the human back in the equation albeit at a, at a much different level than, you know, just dealing with you and I. It's all about doing this across scales so that you can see different demographics and things like that. Okay, so at the end of the day, search is dead, long live search. So with that kind of in mind, I'm going to go into a little bit of a background of just definitions around what I think this search discovery and analytics means to me, or SDA, you'll hear me probably use that acronym a fair amount. We'll look at some uh, architectures, these are both ones that I've seen personally, ones I've uh, built on, worked on, and then also I think what you're seeing evolving out of a, a number of companies and a number of uh, 
communities around this kind of stuff. We'll, we'll look at it from an abstract side, and then I'll talk a little bit about practical experience that I've had on this. And then we'll dig into this a little bit deeper and, and look at some of the components involved uh, in my particular case or in cases I'm very familiar with, and then uh, we'll wrap it all up, okay? So in terms of search discovery and analytics, you know, the big question is why? Why, why, do, why do you care about this? Why does this uh, resonate? I, I've talked to a lot of people about it. It seems to resonate very nicely with what people are building. And I think it comes from a, a few things. You know, first off, uh, when you're dealing with unstructured content or multi-structured content, i.e. text, uh, all of that subjectivity means that you need to have people involved in what you're doing with this text, right? And so it's not enough to just go off and run a whole bunch of batch processing jobs and at the end spin out a, a bunch of counts about what's in that data. You need to be able to query that data and you want to be able to do that in real time. And of course, you know, in the, the age we live in, real time is, is really re literally real time these days. We need to be even, you know, like five minute turnaround time is often not enough. And so you want that real time ad hoc access to the content uh, and then I think the second item there, this notion of aggressive prioritization around uh, importance is becoming much more popular, much more interesting for people who are building these kinds of systems, right? You know, when you have 5 billion documents or 10 billion or 100 billion items, you as a human, you, you can't deal with that on in, in any notion that you're familiar with, right? Whether that's your inbox or streams coming in, right? So you need tools that can really help you prioritize what's going on with that content. And, and in my mind, you have to be very, very aggressive about this. I don't want the system to go and hide things for me, but I want to make sure that the system's showing me things that I need to see at the right point in time. I think, you know, if you just think about your personal experience with email, right, or with all your Twitter streams and Facebook updates and all of those things, you very much feel this on a daily basis that, yes, I, I really like this notion that everything's time-based, Right? But you also have kind of this nagging, uh, nagging in the back of your head that says, God, I must be missing something, right? I, you know, what was that email that I got a week ago that I know I'm supposed to respond to, but I haven't yet, right? And so you can actually extrapolate this across the enterprise or across everything you do. And so you need this notion of, of importance. And with that notion of importance also comes this notion of serendipity, i.e. that developers are there and it's like, they can't see eye to eye at all. And it's because the developers are all fascinated with all of the working parts of all of this, but they don't have any clue about the, the bigger picture. And the business people are all saying, ah, I, don't, I don't care so much about the working parts, just give me what I want, right? And what the business often wants is they want much deeper insight into their users and into their content. So they want to know where to make the investments, right? Should I be spending more money cleaning up? It needs to be done cost-effective way, and I think it also needs to be done in such a way that you can leverage existing internal knowledge. For me, that internal knowledge is often the fact that people all know how to do search. They all know how to interact with that, key, uh, that text box, and so they know how to enter queries, etc. Don't worry, developers, I haven't forgot about you. What do you need to do to, to build out a system like this? Obviously, we have search in the title of this talk, so we need fast, efficient, scalable search. Uh, basically, in my mind, you need to be able to do search at Hadoop scale or, or that kind of scale where you're talking uh, terabytes and petabytes, et cetera. You need to be able to do that at, in, in bulk. You need to be able to get all of that data in when you have it kind of built up. Uh, and then you also need to be able to bring it in in real time. Uh, and you should be able to do all of this search at sub-second, uh, both for search and fastening, because fastening is one of those key ways to help uh, do discovery. And then, of course, we need things like large-scale, cost-effective storage and processing. I think if you guys are at this conference, you full well know what I'm talking about for both of those things. Uh, essentially, though, you need to be able to ask questions of all the data you have. I was just recently at a pretty large US-based e-commerce company, and uh, interestingly enough, they, they were using a commercial product in, in the process of switching over to Hadoop, and they, they essentially they have, they've kept all of their data over all the years, but the problem is, is only about three months of their data was actually active that they could go and do analysis at, over it. Everything else had already been kind of rolled up, and one of the things that they were really looking forward to with Hadoop is they could keep all of their sales data in, uh, in a single place and then just you know, see things much 
Ask more questions of it in a year-over-year -year basis as opposed to the three-month basis. Um, and of course, some of these other things are, are pretty obvious. You need to be able to do experimentation and you need tools for sampling, all of that. Uh, last but not least, since we're dealing with unstructured content, we need uh, tools like natural language processing and machine learning things that can really help uh, take some of this burden off the fact that, uh, you know, dealing with text is, is still a really hard problem and, and we as humans aren't uh, necessarily that good at dealing with it at scale. So anything we can do to make that easier is really helpful, right? So in terms of uh, getting a little bit more practical, I thought I'd start off with what I see as kind of a, a generic diagram of what people are building in this space. I won't say it's right for everybody in every situation, but I've seen it, I think, enough times now to, to say that this is more or less the architecture people are building here. Uh, starting kind of with this layer, uh, you essentially have got three pieces. You need distributed processing, you need a search engine, and then you probably have some type of uh, place that you want to store, like your real-time metrics or things that you're calculating uh, um, that aren't necessarily structured. Because, you know, search does a really good job at the unstructured stuff, but maybe not so much at uh, dealing with things like metrics, et cetera, or, or kind of that metadata, numerical data. Although I will say that that's been changing pretty significantly in, in recent memory, right? And so what you then need is you need a way to tie all of these together such that your, your raw data is in your index when it needs to be in the index, it's in your distributed file system when it needs to be in the distributed file system or whatever you choose here. And then most importantly, I think, when it comes to bringing the users back into the equation, you have a way of saying, you know, that you can sit and, and take all of the logs from there and all the logs from here, and then you can seamlessly work on them as needed, too. Um, and so, you know, I think in the back of your mind, since you guys are familiar with a lot of the technologies, you can kind of fill in the blanks around what each of those are. Um, and then, like, if we move up the stack to the top there, this is where I think it starts to get more interesting because now you're starting to overlay on top of it the kind of tools that you really need to do SDA. So this is things like machine learning capability, statistical analysis capability, uh, access to your documents in, in both real-time ways and, and batch processing ways, and then also, uh, importantly, being able to do some user modeling kinds of things. And then uh, kind of forming the base of all of it is this notion of experiment management, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. Take and glue that all together, and then combine it with ways of getting your content in and provide out a nice, clean uh, way of users accessing this, and now you have essentially a, a SDA system uh, that you might be interested in building, right? So for me, starting at this layer and what I'm talking about and what I've been building and working on, uh, I'm using Solar and Hadoop and HBase. I've seen other people use Hadoop and Cassandra and Solar and uh, Hadoop and Cassandra and Elasticsearch or MongoDB, whatever, whatever you kind of want to fill in there. I think there's all a lot of good tools out in open, open source. These are the ones uh, I've chosen, but you, know, you can certainly go and, and look at others. And then at this top layer, interestingly enough, I mean, you're getting a lot more good open source tools around natu natural language processing, around machine learning. For me, things like PIG, Mahout, R, Statistics, uh, to some extent, I'm just starting to play with Gate, but there's also uh, tools like OpenNLP and the Stanford uh, Natural Language Processing, and there's Mallet, et cetera. So there's a whole bunch of tools that are becoming more and more prevalent here. One of the hard things with uh, the natural language processing tools is they still are very CPU intensive and very IO intensive, and so they don't always scale so well, but I think you're starting to see more and more investment there. On the glue side, pretty much you can take and combine this with Zookeeper, or some Zookeeper-like tool that knows, you know, essentially who's up and who's down and who's available and all of that. You put this together in a, a service-based framework, and I think you have a pretty uh, robust and reliable system that you can scale out pretty well. Underneath, uh, kind of then the, the last piece down here is, uh, you know, what do I do to take care of all of the kind of infrastructure around this, the provisioning, the monitoring? For me, that's been Chef and Zabbix. I've seen people do Puppet, uh, Ganglia, Nagios, all of those. Uh, basically, you, you pick and choose. 
I kind of left off uh, content acquisition in terms of specific things. We at Lucid have uh, our own connector capabilities, but uh, really there, it comes down to what, where personally your data is already. And so a lot of people spend a fair amount of their time on their own content acquisition side of the equation there. But, you know, tools like Nutch or large scale crawling often come in here. Uh, tools like Scoop, et cetera, are often also used. Uh, but it really just depends on, on where your actual data is because that's where a lot of your domain knowledge is. And then your job is to translate that into something that can be uh, put into this kind of system. Okay? So that's kind of the, the high level basics. I thought I would get in a little bit more into some of the practical sides, the things that uh, you know, we've been experiencing and, and, and what we've seen out uh, amongst customers in the community. Uh, I think solar is, is pretty straightforward here, or search is pretty straightforward here. Obviously, you're going to be indexing your content into that system. You want to make it available for that ad hoc access. Uh, increasingly, uh, we're starting to see more and more people actually use it as the authoritative document store. In fact, I was just talking with uh, a few people this morning. Obviously, we're biased because we're Lucene and solar people, but I said to them, you know, uh, I can't remember the last time I had uh, a customer or somebody in the community say, I lost content in Lucene or solar. Uh, it's, been, it's been years, in fact, where I've seen that in the community. And so, you know, much more, very effective as a document storage, and plus, you know, you can, so you can use it kind of as a pretty effective key value store, and then, oh, by the way, you get a uh, search over all of those values, so why not? Um, adding on top of solar, if you haven't heard yet, there's, you know, a lot of around making distributed indexing search, all of that, much easier using solar cloud. Uh, I think on the Hadoop and HBase side, pretty straightforward. Uh, this is kind of where typically you're storing all of the kind of the really large files that you need, your logs, your raw files, all your intermediate batch processing output. Um, for us, we use WebHDFS as well as a way for people to get content in. Uh, one of the things, though, I think a lot of us struggle with, uh, and I know there are some vendors who, who uh, solve this in Hadoop, is you often start with a lot of very small files, right? Like if you're a big organization, think about how many PDFs you have in your uh, in your, uh, across your company, right? Well, getting them all into Hadoop is, is still a pain in the butt, and then getting them into a way that you can process them effectively at, at scale is, is still a little bit of a pain in the butt. Um, and then on HBase for us, what we're primarily doing is storing all of the, the things that are kind of the output of the analytics pieces. It's also where, uh, for instance, as you're getting into doing more personalization, in your search engine where we're storing things like all, every query that every user ever did. And so then you can start to generate things like you know, personalized content. It's also where you can track like all of their clicks, et cetera. Uh, and then for, for us, for a while now, we've been still having this debate as to which one should be the authoritative document store. There's kind of trade-offs for both as to whether you put it into, into your search engine or into HBase. Right now, uh, we're leaning more towards it being in HBase, but you know, solar is still making a strong case, especially with some of the things that are coming in uh, solar, uh, in solar four. Um, the other thing I think you're, one of the things you often see at this layer is there's always this challenge between when is something supposed to be real time, when can I have access to it immediate, and when, when is it a batch processing job. So for instance, if you kick off a large scale clustering job, like using Mahout, Right, well, that takes some time, and, and it's generally designed to work over a, a very a large amount of that data, right? But then what do you do when you've got data coming in all of the time? How do you get that, that content clustered as it comes into the system uh, in such a way that the users still have a holistic view of what all the clusters are? And so you've got to go and work on that. And, and the answer often for that particular case is that you just find the nearest cluster that it belongs to, and then you save it off, and then the next time you run clustering, it, uh, it gets incorporated in, right? And then uh, the third kind of thing that we've often asked the question around in terms of this operating system level is where should the analysis be done? Where should I do this kind of work, right? At the real-time layer, right, you want all of your analysis right as all of your content's coming in or right as users are interacting with it. So, you know, tools like HBase and Solar are much better at that, but when you want to do the really large scale stuff, you know, Hadoop is, is often the choice there, right? You're using something like Pig or Hive or whatever, right? So you kind of have to be really smart about which ones 
uh, where, where you choose to do what kinds of things, right? And I know, like, uh, I think Ted's giving a talk later on combining uh, real-time with batch uh, analytics at scale. And, and so you're starting to see these systems evolve where it's like Hadoop plus Storm or Hadoop plus some type of streaming kind of system. Um, and so that's all really interesting, too, when it comes to how does that then factor into uh, when you add search into the equation. Um, and, you know, some of the analysis is already done in search, too, like faceting. You know, many people are calculating histograms and things like that. That's all part of the equation, too. In terms of search and practice, uh, been at enough places with enough people that I know that all you developers care mostly about is performance and scaling and, and perhaps some of the uh, IT side or the ops side. And then the business people spend all of their time on relevance, so I thought I would talk a little bit about those in terms of search uh, with solar. On the, uh, on the solar front, um, yes, indeed, solar does scale. We've had uh, customers who have had billions of documents in solar since solar 1.4. Uh, we are now almost about ready to release Solar.40. The question really comes down to is how much work do you spend in doing this? So in, prior to Solar.4, uh, Solar it was more work involved, but you could do it. Whereas I think with Solar Cloud and what's in Solar 4, a lot of this stuff come, becomes a lot easier, right? And so it's, you get all of the goodness and all of the reliability that Solar has had for so many years, and now you can much more easily scale it out as well. And so Solar Cloud builds on things like Zookeeper and, and takes care of all of the knowing you, you don't have to have this notion of a master and worker anymore. You just send your documents into Solar and it takes care of all the replication and all of that stuff. You bring nodes up and you bring nodes down. They, they know where to go join based on uh, what your uh, current state of your system is. And of course, we're adding more capabilities to this as well. You'll, You'll, uh, right now, you have to declare how many shards you have up front, but we should have the ability to do like full-on rebalancing here within the next few months. Uh, don't quote me on the exact date, but uh, you should have that kind of stuff. Um, and this is not where, you know, like, it's not, not necessarily just a micro-sharding approach, but where you can just, you don't have to even declare the number of micro-shards you have up front. You can do arbitrary splitting as you see fit, okay? Uh, if you've been using SolarJ for a long time, it's pretty much a one-line code change to use what's now called the, the cloud solar server, and that's Zookeeper Aware, and then knows how to do all of this stuff for you. So pretty straightforward. Um, and if you want, you know, you can also do near real-time stuff. This is the system setup we have. So again, you know, I think in SolarLand, we like to give you choices, and so you can tune your system what, what you see fit um, while trying to still give you some intelligent defaults for us. Uh, there's this notion in, in uh, solar of soft commits, essentially what you're, you're this is actually in Lucene, the Lucene level, you're not doing a, a, a F-sync to the disk on those soft commits, and so you can very quickly turn around all of your content on a pretty regular basis. And then what the hard commit does is just, it, it makes sure it truly is synced to disk, and so you can play with, uh, play with those factors depending on how reliable you think your hardware is. Um, but for the most part, it should just work, and you don't have to go and do anything with that. On the relevance side, uh, you spend a lot of time with customers about doing relevance. Uh, there's always this kind of fundamental question of, well, how do I get better relevance? And, and they, they, they usually start with the fact that they already think they have a solution because somebody came in and told them their relevance isn't as good. It's typically like your manager or, you know, your CEO was doing a search and then, uh, you know, whatever they did a search for, they weren't happy with the results, and so then your job is really hell for the next few uh, days or weeks until you can figure out why your CEO's particular query wasn't so good. Um, but in reality, you know, what I often try to do with developers is give them the, the fuel to go back and say, no, 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 trust me, your query may not be good, but the overall system uh, is still operating very well. And so what you often see is this, what you're seeing now more and more is, is just uh, much more sophisticated uh, capabilities around testing. Like, you should basically always be testing. We've got one, uh, one customer who, I mean, they're just constantly running experiments with their search system all the time. Like, literally every day they probably have four or five different experiments going on, and they're sending, you know, X percentage of traffic to, you know, that particular system or that particular system. Uh, this is another e-commerce company. I think in the, in the span of about three months of doing this, they've increased their sales by like five or six percent. 
Uh, now, that may not sound like a lot, but they've been doing e-commerce for a long time, and 5 or 6% is huge for them. It's so much so that the business side said, turn it on full time, we're ready to go, even though the developers are all saying, no, 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 wait. And they're like, no, 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 5% is huge, we want that right now. Um, and so essentially, you know, what a lot of this comes down to in terms of the testing side is you're looking at your top, look at your moneymaker queries, and then do some sampling around them. Go through and actually you've got to spend some time looking at the results. Uh, and then also looking at your click logs. And then pretty much when you're designing your system, you need to pretty much just track everything all the time, right? So I think all of us are pretty good at logging queries and clicks. Uh, you're starting to see more people actually comparing what people are actually clicking on versus what was actually displayed on the page, i.e. what was not chosen. That can be very useful. And I think you're even starting to see, and this really creates for a, a big data problem, is actually you know, installing some JavaScript that is going to be sending uh, what people, where the mouse is, what they're scrolling at, all of that. That's a little crazy to me yet, but I have seen a few places that are doing that. Uh, and you talk about a lot of volume of data. Uh, last but not least, people often around relevance ask me, well, is there one thing I could do? And most of the time it's just churn on phrases. Even if the user forgot to put quotes around their, uh, their multi-term query, automatically churn that into a phrase and you almost always have a winner. Okay? So that's kind of the search side. And you know, like I said earlier, in many ways, search for me is a commodity. And so what then... Uh, my experience with, with a lot of people is they start to look at, well, what's the next level up? Where can I start adding this kind of notion of discovery? And I think you're starting to see more and more of this across a lot of different places. Of You want kind of this notion, there's a couple different notions of, of discovery here. This, I talked about serendipity a bit earlier. Uh, I would add another column around organization of your content, and then the last one being this notion of, hey, you know, is my data really good? Is there any ways I can improve that? Should I be expending effort into cleaning up some of this content? So, you know, on the serendipity side, many of these you're all familiar with just from, you know, living on the internet these days. So, you know, what's trending? What are the topics of interest? How can I recommend content to people? Uh, doing things like more like this, did you mean? Uh, last but not least, statistically interesting phrases is another uh, common one I think you're starting to see more and more of. And then at the organization level, this really gets down to that aggressive prioritization that I was talking about earlier. Um, you're starting to see evolve like with like Google's priority inbox and other places, more of this notion of importance, which I would say is kind of a combination of relevance plus time and, and, and other things. Uh, it's still a bit of a loose uh, definition. Um, but, you know, and here's where I think how it comes into play for me a lot is things like clustering, classification, et cetera. And then on the data cleanliness side, you know, really just trying to better understand what's good. Uh, one of the stories I've always told, one of our first clients at Lucid, a very large, uh, a very, very large company, and one of their key uh, products was always on page 10 of their search results. And this was no doubt costing them millions of dollars a day, right? And we went in there and and it turned out that one of their key fields that they searched for that particular product didn't have a description. So they went back that night, you know, called up the data entry clerk, they fixed it, and the next day it was, you know, number one for that search, and everybody was happy. So don't discount kind of those simple kinds of things around having tools that can help you better understand what's wrong with your data. Uh, and maybe you don't necessarily want to spend all your time on that or invest a lot in fixing it because you've got a lot of it, but you should at least be aware of it. Uh, and, you know, one of the challenges, I think, is that a lot of this stuff is really process intensive. Like, just alone, like if you're doing Mahout clustering at scale, although Ted's got some interesting numbers for a new uh, K-means capability uh, or K-nearest K neighbors, it's still, you know, it's a very iterative process to do lots of iterations, and Hadoop is not a lot of fun. There are some new frameworks coming out that I think make that a lot easier, but it's still a pretty intensive process. Uh, and then the other part that I always have, problem I have with the discovery side is a lot of it's very subjective, right? I mean, what is important to, what is important to me is not as what's important to you, and so you often have this notion of a general model and then you overlay on top of it models that are kind of per user, which, which essentially track like the delta difference between the two. Um, so just a, kind of a variety of ideas. 
If you haven't ha heard of Mahout, I think Mahout has tools for a lot of these capabilities. Uh, I would say we primarily focus on what I call the three C's, essentially collaborative filtering, classification, clustering, collaborative filtering being a form of recommendations. Um, also can do some interesting other things like co-locations, which you can think of as statistically interesting phrases. Go through all of your content and find where you know, words co-occur more likely than they do in, all, in the rest of the content. That can be really helpful for getting a better sense of what's in your content as well as making for better search. Uh, SVD, singular value decomposition, one of the kind of the key tools that uh, I think a lot of people use when it comes to understanding their content. That can be uh, interesting. Um, some of the challenges we face, both as a community and personally in Mahout, uh, you know, you're starting to see again more and more pushback around these really, you know, big iterative jobs. Like if you take k-means in Mahout, that can, you know, be 10 or 20 different iterations. So you've got to uh, be willing to invest in optimizing all of that. Uh, Mahout is also very command line oriented because of kind of the batch nature of, of Hadoop. I think we're starting to make some inroads into to doing that. And of course, uh, some areas of it are less mature than others, but I think if you focus on the main, the three C's, you're in pretty good shape these days, especially uh, probably the recommenders is probably the most popular. Just as kind of an aside, I mentioned earlier this notion around experiment management. I think you're starting to see uh, more and more people get serious about this stuff. I, I think, you know, a lot of us are doing A-B testing, but you know, it's still kind of premature in how well we're doing it, especially when it comes to experimenting around search. Uh, and it's also like all of this relevant stuff and all of that is always kind of seems to be after you have the system up and running, right? And I, I really think, you know, that's a, that's a sad thing for you to do if you're really going to be serious about uh, search. So companies that where search is their primary way of making money, uh, they, they take this stuff all very serious. Kind of the rest of us where it's just part of your application, maybe not so much. And I, I would warrant that even those people where it's not so much, you need to make much more earlier plans as to how to do experimentation. So I think, you know, a lot of it just comes from putting in place that you want to be able to try out different variations of all of these models. Because again, this is a subjective problem, right? So you want to be able to try out different ways of doing indexing, analysis, query parsing, scoring formulas, especially like your machine learning models, et cetera. So build all of that right into your application. And then the nice thing is this also helps you with your uh, development to, to QA, to staging, to production model. You can use the same kind of experiment management across all that. And then of course, when you have an SDA system like this, well, these are all just more numbers that you're crunching and more analytics. So just use all of the stuff that you've already built around understanding how the, your end users are doing with the system and use that internally uh, for your own purposes as well. And so when you're all said and done, experiment management becomes a really important part of this. And I've yet to see anybody in an open source or a commercial project offering that has this really nailed down and baked in right from the get-go such that you have it kind of ingrained in your system. So, But I do think it's the future. Uh, in terms of the analytics components, I've seen a, a wide variety of use uh, here. I think uh, Solar has a number of things built into it, faceting, et cetera, as well as a lot of your understanding around performance. Uh, our statistics seems to be the, the package to, uh, of choice for getting your content out. And so, like analytics, even though like earlier on with the search and discovery, a lot of that is just integrating those things into your application. On this side of the equation, I think it's much more straightforward to say, oh, I'm gonna go use some other packages that are out there already. So instead of you trying to reinvent the wheel, go off and, and just get R or get uh, SAS or whatever it is that you already have. Um, and then for me, a lot of these metrics come around how to, you know, start with search and discovery first, because that's really where, you know, that's your bread and butter. How can I go and learn more about those? In terms of putting this all into practice, uh, in, in especially looking at from search and discovery, kind of some of the basic things I think you should be tracking right off the bat, but then you can expand out from there. The simple, just, you know, a lot of this analytics stuff comes down to counting, of course. Uh, so, you know, one of the, some of the things you get right out of the box with solar or similar systems is faceting, and, and you can, of course, get at Lucene's term and, and document frequencies as well. Those are quite useful 
especially when you start to look at co-occurrences between terms uh, and, and across documents. Um, things like starting to measure, uh, things like mean reciprocal rank, that's a really easy calculation to do on your search logs, but gives you a, a nice uh, manager level metric that you can say to the manager, oh, our MRR has gotten this much better since we put in these, pla these things in place. Uh, and then getting into things where you're starting to look more and more around uh, the number of results that are returned. This is another one that keeps managers happy, I think, because when you start to see, like, if your system has a lot of zero results or has way too many results, maybe those are signs that you should start tweaking your uh, queries a bit more or looking at other ways that you can uh, help users get at what they want. Uh, and then, you know, the log and navigation analysis, that's all about looking at what people are clicking at and things like that. Um, and then, you know, I mentioned earlier around the data cleanliness uh, analysis kind of stuff. That's all really helpful, again, for like those situations where you've just got bad data, okay? And, and you'll find a lot of interesting things there, especially at pretty large scales. So with that, I think... Uh, more or less covered the basics of an SDA system. How many people are building similar kinds of things? So a fair number of you, yeah. I mean, I think this is really the, uh, where, where uh, the present of search is in terms of uh, what people are wanting to do with these kinds of things. I've seen a lot of kind of homegrown piecemeal where they've tried to tack things on, these things on in place afterwards, after they realize that Especially if you're new to search, you're kind of like, oh, well, search is going to be really hard. It's a subjective problem. I don't know how to do it. And then they kind of realize that if you take like a tool like Lucene or Solar or any of the other variants around it, that that part was actually pretty easy, getting your content up and searchable. So then the, the discovery and analytics piece is, is much more uh, uh, important, right? Uh, for us, me personally, Solar, Hadoop, Mahout is, is a pretty nice combination of tools that makes a lot of this easy. You do have to spend some time on glue, but it's it's really not that uh, hard of a problem in terms of gluing these together. Uh, and then, you know, last but not least is I think when it comes to designing these search-based applications, you really do need, uh, need to take a bigger picture view of it. Um, I, I've been telling a fair number of people, one of the best things I've gotten to do at Lucid Imagination is actually take a step back from development. And I did uh, pre-sales and I did post-sales, and I've done training and consulting. And, and, you know, all of those things is when you're a hardcore developer, you're like, eh, you know, not so much. I don't really like talking to customers, or I don't really want to be involved in the sales side of things. But for me personally, it's given me a really interesting perspective about what the real world is really after. And it, I think as a developer, it makes you a lot better developer when you have kind of that business side to you. And so even though I hear a lot of developers saying, oh, I don't even care about that stuff, I just want to work on cool technology. When you have the bigger picture in mind in the system you're building, you end up with a much better product. And then also, you, uh, you know what, you know, the support guys and the ops guys, you, you've been in their shoes, so now you want to make your code that much better too because you realize sometimes, oh yeah, the pain that they've lived through with my code before, I don't want that to happen to them. So you, you, you work a whole lot harder to make sure you have really solid code that scales and stays up. So with that, uh, I think we've got a few minutes for questions. You can find me at various places. I think it's pretty straightforward these days to find somebody. So any questions? Okay. Uh, first, thanks to the speaker. I have maybe, maybe it's an unusual question, but how much of machine learning uh, versus numerical analytics do you see now in you know, like your customer work that they trust and they need it? <laughs> so the question, how much they trust it and how much they need it? I mean, I think one of the dirty little secrets around machine learning, you know, everybody likes the notion of machine learning, but I think a lot of, it, it ends up being a, you know, as, as subjective as search is, I think machine learning requires even more experimentation to get it good. Uh, and so I think that's also why that it's pretty critical that you have an experiment management uh, capability in place for when you're going to do this, because you're going to be trying out different models, different feature selections, all of those things to uh, try to get at what the real stuff is. Um, in terms of you know, what the split is, I think there's more and more interest in the machine learning, but still people are, you know, 
the day to day, you know, a lot of the, the core analytics that they're doing is, is where they, you know, that, that, that in many ways they have tools already in place that do that. So business intelligence tools, things like that. So that's probably where most people are, but they're interested in adding more of the machine learning capabilities because they've heard Google, Facebook, Twitter, et cetera, is doing it. And so it sounds uh, more important. Other questions? Okay. So for a, uh, if you have a large company that's implementing a system like this, they have a lot of dependencies, um, internal software, external customers, integrations. Do you have any thoughts about how you would build an API to, to best integrate with a system like this? Well, so I've been, I mean, we actually are building around this. I mean, what we've done is build uh, old REST APIs. We put versions around a lot of it so that you have, uh, you know, essentially tools around all of your data management so that you can have different collections for people who are doing different things. Um, I, I think still one of the challenges ends up being this whole, you know, uh, moving from state, you know, like QA through staging to production, and then how do you then give tools to the business people, which of course isn't going to be APIs, but how do you give tools to them so that they can actually manage and control the experiments, right? Because like a lot of the places we, we go into, the business people, you know, the techies all love open source and all that, and then the business people are like, yeah, but I'm missing the kind of friendly tools that I've had for uh, you know, especially like in search for changing my results based on if I'm running a sale or a promotion or I want a certain document to be at the top. Now, thankfully, that's changing, but um, y you end up, I think, you end up probably doing this a couple times in terms of building out the APIs, and then, of course, the visualization layers on top of it becomes a lot more important. Does that answer the question a little bit? Yeah, it's not an easy one, though, I, I agree. And I, you know, I think also that's where the experiment management stuff comes in too. So in experiment management is, is not that hard. It's just you know, you've got to keep track of everything. And then the key is to be able to compare it against uh, previous versions, et cetera. So in many ways, it's uh, uh, just you know, version control problem, right? Um, but you know, it's still uh, quite useful. I, I often li like in version control, it's like you know, taking out the garbage, right? If uh, we all just live in a world where the garbage man shows up every week and gets rid of the garbage, but God forbid the garbage people go on strike and then you have to deal with uh, uh, garbage you know, that's been piling up for week after week, right? Uh, that's kind of like version management to me, right? Is you, you need it, and if you don't do it right, you're going to have a lot of garbage pile up, but if you do it right, then it should just work kind of thing. Maybe one more? Question. So you basically said that uh, search actually is, is not the, the, the big problem anymore. It's, it's already done in, in one or the other way, in Solar or in uh, Elasticsearch. But then it comes to classification and, and machine learning. I mean, isn't this not actually, actually the future? I mean, what, what we actually have to work on the most in the next, let's say, years to come? Yeah, I mean, I, well, first off, so don't quote me that search is done. I mean, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work in search, and it's still, uh, you know, because it's a subjective problem, it's, it's, it's hard, right? I mean, there's always this fuzziness to it, and so there's presumably always ways that you can better deal with that fuzziness. But, yeah, I mean, I think, uh, you know, like, if you take Lucene, et cetera, right, you get... I've always said, uh, you know, people ask us to compare commercial search vendors versus open source, and all that. I'll take it, the core algorithms in Lucene and Solar are as good as any of those. I've done, I've done the benchmarks. We've had customers do the benchmarks, et cetera. The core retrieval engine, you know, the model hasn't changed in a lot of years there. What then becomes the question with search is, what are the things that you're putting on top of it to enhance the model that aren't just, that you don't just get from having a vector space model or a probabilistic model, right? But so yeah, the classification, like query classification, that's a really hard problem, right? How do you take just a few keywords and then put it into the appropriate bucket so then maybe you can uh, filter better, right? So is this query about, uh, uh, barbecues, or is it about, uh, you know, I don't know, dogs, right? And then you would filter your results appropriately, right? So if somebody's searching for hot dogs, you know, maybe they, they you send them to the barbecue section, but if they're searching for poodles or, you know, or, or large, large breed dogs, then you would send them to the pet store, right? That's a hard problem when you've only got a few... Uh, 
uh, a few queries. And so you see a lot of people, especially I think in e-commerce, you, you see a lot of them investing in, uh, in machine learning for those kinds of things, as well as rule-based systems that kind of, you know, where they can't quite get all the machine learning right, sometimes they, they hack it with rules on top of it. Uh, but yeah, it, it is uh, in many ways the future, it's the present. I, I think you, you end up building a system like this these days. That's what you know, we see out of a lot of our higher-end clients and, and in the community. Okay, thanks again. Thank you.